Good morning, and welcome to today's webcast, Elevating Work, Human Resources Trends in 2024. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome, and thanks for joining. We're pleased to present our continuing professional education webcast series. Before we begin, please keep the following in mind. You can customize how you view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top right of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons that relate to a different aspect of our session. You can download a PDF of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget. You can ask questions by typing in the Q&A window and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session offers one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy requirements. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of polling questions. To participate in the polls, please check the button next to your answer within the slide window and click Submit. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE Progress widget and download your CPE certificate. Don't worry if you can't download your CPE certificate today. We'll email you a copy in two weeks. If attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our Group CPE Attendance Sheet, available in our slide deck and handouts widget to receive credit. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. CPE credit can only be awarded to participants registered as themselves and isn't available for participants who view the on-demand version. This presentation is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. I'm pleased to introduce today's presenters from Moss Adams, Human Capital Practice Leader, Brett Addis, and from Academy to Innovate HR, Chief Scientist, Dieter Feldsman. With that, I'll turn it over to Brett to get us started. Yeah, thanks, Chad. Um, and just by way of quick, quick introduction, um, if you have not joined any of these webcasts before, um, I lead the Human Capital Advisory practice within uh, Moss Adams. I've been in the HR and human capital space for, for 25 years. Um, and one of the things that we like to do is, is, we, is we think about how we engage our existing clients and our prospects is really be very thoughtful and mindful about some of the content that, that we put in front of, um, in front of y'all, frankly. And um, so I had an opportunity to work with uh, Dr. Velsman, Dieter, we will call, and uh, we're talking a lot about some of the upcoming trends in 2024, some of the past trends, and you know, he, he had some content that just thought was really fantastic for, for us to share today. So this is going to be one of the scenarios where I'm going to let Dr. Dieter do most of the talking, but I will be interjecting throughout. But before we get to that point in the introduction, Dr. Dieter, quick introduction from you. Thanks so much, Britt. And um, yeah, please call me Dieter. It's a lovely to be here with you as well and look forward to, to our session and the conversation about what's changing in the world of work. So thanks for having me. Awesome. And as we go through this, you guys will notice there's a Q&A session. Uh, we're going to answer some questions towards the end, but um, you know, to keep the questions top of mind, please feel free to um, to, uh, to pop them in the, the chat. So before we get started, I'm just going to cover this really quickly. Um, you know, first and foremost, we're going to cover the overview and learning objectives, which I'll cover here in just a second. And then there's three core areas that um, that we're going to cover today. Um, and before I dive into these, I just want to say that, you know, as we think about what's going on in the workforce um, and as we really start to unpacking some of this content, these trends were just perfect fit for cross industry organizations and 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 based on the conversations I have with clients and peers every day that just fit in really, really perfectly. So the first thing we're going to talk about is really the, the mega trends changing how we work. Um, 
as we think about our people, our processes, our technology, lots changing in the world today. And we're gonna spend some time unpacking some of that. The second is around impact on people practices. So how do we work as, as people? How do we think about uh, all of these new trends and, and things like that around future of work and aligning ourselves better to work? Uh, and then lastly, the people professional of the future, which is gonna tie a lot into some of the future skills and capabilities that as we in organizations are looking for, um, relating to fill some of our open positions or looking in terms of the future positions and all of these other things, we're gonna spend some time on that as well. And then I said, we're gonna wrap it up and we will open it up for some, some questions. So to get started, I, I, I really like this session overview and I'm gonna unpack this a little bit um, before I just read the whole thing, then I'm gonna turn it over to, to Deer to really take it away. But um, when we kind of look at this overview, change is desperately needed in the workforce. I think that's a common denominator. We'll all say, yes, it definitely is. Uh, organizations face a labor shortage while millions of workers are unnecessarily sidelined. And I want you to think about that for just a second, right? We're, we all have these open positions that we're try trying to fill, whether they're now, whether in the future, but we have a lot of people on the sidelines looking for work. And we're gonna talk about why that is um, and some of the areas that we could help you all think about in terms of pulling some of those workers in. And then productivity stagnates despite the democratization of powerful new technology, right? So just a quick pause there and think about all of the things you're seeing on the news as it relates to AI and system changes and all of these pieces you know, how do we start leveraging that more as organizations to really drive better efficiency, quality, and effectiveness to how we work? And also think about it from the customer's perspective is your ability to do all the things provides better customer satisfaction. As workers uh, re-examine their relationship with work, it's clear that traditional career structures have reached their limit. So historically, as we think about the hierarchy of work and, and the way that we work, uh, a lot of us are experiencing workers asking, can we, can we be more flexible? Can we work four days versus five? Can I work remote? How our relationship between work and organizations are really starting to, I would say, kind of hit a tipping point. And uh, it's really going to force organizations to start thinking differently about how we retain and motivate and engage our employees. And a lot of this has nothing to do with compensation and money, right? A lot of this is around looking at the next generational needs and aligning how we work to those needs. Uh, and the work is at its crossroads and HR departments can provide the breakthrough needed to get it back on track. And so this is really as we start thinking about, uh, for those of you who have HR organizations, for those of you who don't, we're really looking at the workforce in general what are some of those key activities and, and priorities that we need to put in place to really get our workforce back the way we need it to be at the same time supporting the workforce needs of the future? So with that said, drum roll. I don't, I don't really have a drum roll, but I'm gonna pass it over to you, Peter. Thanks so much, Brickton. I think thank you for the, the wonderful um, introduction as well. And maybe let me kickstart really by also just saying and introducing myself. As Brett has mentioned, my name is Dr. Dieter Feltzman. So I'm the Chief Scientist for HR and OD at the Academy to Innovate HR. Very, very passionate, passionate HR professional. And what this means also at the Academy is I'm responsible for engaging with our clients as well as talking about a lot of our thought leadership practices are going to look like trying to understand that and helping our clients prepare for what that next step needs to be. Now, Brett has set us up really nicely for our conversation, and I want to focus on three elements over the next 30 to 40 minutes. And the first one is, I wanna talk about five trends that's really changing the way that we think about work. And I want you to reflect for a moment and think back 10, 15, 20, 25 years, it doesn't matter how long you've been in the workforce, what you call work today and what work was is significantly different. And when we start looking towards the future, there's going to be a couple of big things that's going to start to happen. That's going to change and lead us into what we are calling the next chapter of work and what that next era is going to look like. New rules of work, new things that we are going to define. And I just want to highlight five things that we believe that is on the horizon that is important to take note of. It will have a serious implication for organizations, regardless of size and market and industry. 
The second thing I'm going to talk about is what is the impact on people practices. Brett spoke about that to say, you know, whether you've got an HR organization or not, you do have a workforce and it's going to be important for you to understand what are the key focus areas and priorities that need to be on your radar to make sure that you can successfully transition into this future state. And lastly, let's bring it home in terms of the people profession of the future. What are those skill sets when we start talking about the skill of the future? Now I'm going to show you just an output of some of our research that specifically focuses on the people professional, but you can translate that into some of the other roles that you also find within your own organization. A lot of the skills that we are starting to see is universal, but I do wanna deep dive slightly into them a little bit more today, just to give you a bit of a flavor around some of those key things, just to bear in mind when you start thinking about your own organization for the future as well. But before I kick start, I'm going to hand to Chad, just to ask you a very, very quick question around what you believe some of the biggest trends are that's going to have an impact and an influence on your organization. Chad, if you'll lead us into the poll. Thank you, Dieter. And we have our first polling question of the day. Which of the following trends will have the biggest impact on your organization in the future? Either A, the aging workforce, B, lack of available skills, C, rise of artificial intelligence, D, inability to attract and retain talent. So we'll give you about 15 to 20 seconds to answer this first polling question. If you select your answer and hit the submit button, your polling question will be recorded today. Great, do you have a favorite amongst-, amongst You know what, friends? Peter, every time I read this, I see rise of art of, I keep thinking Terminator, it just comes to mind every time. <laughs> Um, you know, there's so many in here, you know, um, I, I would say I would not be surprised if, if the artificial intelligence is a little bit low, um, but it, and that's just because it's still coming out and emerging in a lot of companies. But I think lack of skills is huge, um, lack of retention. And I think, you know, depending on look, and looking at some of the companies that are here, even aging workforce might be a, a pretty major issue. Yeah, definitely look forward to dive into those. To your point, I think um, a rise of AI is one that immediately jumps to mind. But I actually think that there's a lot of other components as well, you know, that people need to yeah. start thinking about a holistic picture. Um, and I'm going to unpack that for us in a bit as well. Exactly. All right. So quite a nice spread and quite a nice mix. Brett, you definitely gazed into your crystal ball there. So. We're seeing inability to attract and retain talent. Um, I'm going to talk about not only the skill shortage, but how the labor market is changing, which is quite an important thing for us to think about. A concept I'm also going to share is really around what we call the hidden workforce. How do you look further than what you are currently searching for from a talent point of view? You can see the aging workforce, a really interesting topic at the moment. People are becoming older. I'm going to deep dive into that a little bit more. What does that mean for our labor practices? What does that mean for career practices? What does that mean for late stage careers? And then kind of a tie there between lack of available skills and the rise of artificial intelligence. Now, as I dive into the next couple of trends, two warnings that you definitely need to take to heart. The first one, I like to share a lot of information, but it's in a storytelling format. So if there are graphs and things, you will get the slides afterwards. Don't the graph and you can't exactly make out the number. It's more important that out of today, you take the argument home around what is the story trying to tell us. The second one, I know I have a very heavy accent and Brett will keep me honest, but I get extremely excited about this topic. So I start picking up speed as we kind of go along. So if he interrupts me and tells me to slow down, Brett, zero offense taken from, from my side. All right, let's deep dive into this first mega trends. And I'm going to highlight five key trends just for us to be aware of that is going to influence and change the way that we perceive and think about work. I'm going to kick start just with some labor market changes. And there's two really interesting things that we need to bear in mind in terms of how the labor market is currently changing. The first one is that we are becoming older and that's as a, as a result of various medical advances. That for us from a workforce and a labor market perspective is that people want to work longer. And we're already starting to see a global trend of retirement ages starting to shift. But on the other side, also a lot of people saying, but hang on, I don't want to retire. I still have a lot to contribute. Now, whether that's for financial reasons, that is in some cases true. But in other cases, a lot of people say, I want to enter a new career stage and new phase. Now, when I talk about the fact that people want to work longer, that does not necessarily mean that they want to continue working in the same way 
that they've worked up to now. And a lot of innovative organizations are already asking the question to say, how can I retain that knowledge? How can I retain that skill set? How can I make sure that we also equip the next generation by still providing these individuals with meaningful work? And here we start talking a lot more about flexibility. We start talking about new benefits. I think an organization that I think is really doing this well, they have, for example, a grandparent benefit. So the same way that you would go on parental leave, they typically also now allow you to go on grandparents' leave. You want to support your new grandchildren that you've just received. Now, it's a silly example, but what it showcases is that they're starting to understand that the needs of their workforce is really starting to change as well. So this, this is going to change the way we have a growing population. And this graph just showcases to you what we call from pyramid to pillar. So in November 2022, depending on who you believe, but this is according to the United Nations, we surpassed 8 billion people on planet Earth. Now, why do I mention that? Because it means that we are going to have to grow over the next 20 to 25 years, the economy in such a way that there's enough work for these people trying to enter the work and the labor market. And at the moment, that is not necessarily the case. Now, I mention this because if we can't provide work to people, people can't consume anything that we produce as organizations, which means we run into all sorts of trouble from a social unrest point of view, as well as also other particular activities to bear in mind. Now, we're also starting to see other shifts starting to influence the labor market around where talent is residing and where talent comes from. And we're seeing quite a big migrant movement at the moment due to various reasons, political reasons, unrest, war. We also typically find climate change starting to have a significant impact around where people are based, where people want to settle down, and how talent is starting to move across the world. And the question you need to ask yourself from a talent point of view is, if I can't find the skills here, where are the skills going to be in a couple of years' time, and how flexible and open am I to these new type of work arrangements that's going to give me access to new type of skill sets and new types of pools? Now, with that, I'm not advocating that everybody has to go full-on digital and full-on remote. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you need to be very aware of the fact that your talent strategy might have new variables that you have to bear in mind if you're going to think about what the labor market is going to do. The next component to bear in mind, the next trend I want to touch on very briefly is also the global economic power shift that we are starting to see. Now, again, we're starting to see, and this is kind of an estimate here from the World Bank by 2035, now, why do I mention this example? Because it's going to influence the way that we think about trade. It's going to influence the way that we think about global policy. And it's definitely going to influence the labor market again in terms of where new opportunities and new work is and opportunities is going to be based and is going to come from. And it's important for us to understand that because there is this global shift that people are calling from the West to the rest. Um, and it is also going to ask us this question in terms of some of the traditional markets. What is our growth appetite as organizations to start entering some of these new territories if you might not be doing business there already? But on the other side, it also means that we are going to have to think very differently about things like supply chain, who we sell to and how we are going to have to collaborate and work together. And it's a real challenge for us here because I've just spoken about the fact that we are going to become more. People want to continue working longer. But again, this is very dependent on the types of opportunities that we can actually provide to people in this particular market. Just because I think it's a real risk towards the viability of, and call it, you know, kind of um, good practice in future, but really around income inequality. Because if we don't necessarily really focus on this, some markets will grow, but it's not necessarily going to solve the inequality challenges that we do find in particular markets. So thinking of markets like South Africa, Brazil, etc., we need to start thinking about how is there going to be a more equal distribution. And I'm going to talk about technology in a moment, but what that's one of our biggest risks around the fact that something like AI can either bring us all together or it can actually create an even bigger divide between the haves and the have-nots in the future. And it's something that we have to be very cognizant of because it's going to have significant and severe implications for us in terms of why and how and where people work and their sustainability into the future as well. That leads me towards my next trend pertaining to resource scarcity. So I've kind of painted the picture here around a growing population, an aging population, economies that's not necessarily growing fast enough and shifting and will grow in other parts of the world than what they do today. But we also need to acknowledge that resource scarcity is going to become a real challenge. 
And you can see here, the earth has become a lot hotter and I'm going to mention climate change because it's already significantly impacting the resources that organizations have got access to when they're trying to execute on their goals and tasks and strategies. Think here about the broken down supply chains that we've seen in places like Germany, Pakistan due to high floods. Think about changes that we've seen in places like Spain in terms of labor legislation because due to extreme heat, they can no longer follow traditional labor construction type of rules that have been there for a number of years as well. Now, I mention this because it's going to change the way that we think about climate adaptive practices, which is something that we really need to help our organizations with. It is about understanding how do we change our way of operation to operate in this new normal whilst still being very cognizant of the footprint and our own contribution towards the broader environment. Now, I mention this because the next critical component we need to think about in terms of resource scarcity is what you've all mentioned, the global talent shortage. And I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but that is actually going to increase over the coming years as well. Because even though the labor market is going to expand, it won't necessarily be with the types of skill sets or the right skill sets at the right time that we actually require in order to build the businesses that's going to build the future. Now, on the one side, it's just a problem of not having the right skills. But on the other side, it's also a problem of even the skill sets that we have today is going to have to reskill in future to remain relevant. Because due to technological change, due to some of the other implications that I've already mentioned, we're going to start seeing that workers requiring a different type of skill set in order to be successful. Now, I'm a very firm supporter of reskilling and bridging programs within organizations. However, the risk on the other side is that we are not doing it fast enough to actually shift the labor market and the labor pool. I want to use an example here of a Belgian company, which I think is doing something really interesting with their data science skill sets requirements. So what they've done is to say, we realize that we are based in a certain location where we do not have enough access to the data scientists that we are going to need to fulfill the needs of our workforce strategy in five years time. What they've then decided to do is to say they will put everybody that is willing in their organization currently, they give them 20% of their time back, so one day a week, where you can actually invest and there's a set program in place for you to develop certain data scientist type of skill sets and tool sets and certifications. In a year's time, you need to pass a certain proficiency assessment. And if you are able to do so, they will transition you out into a new career path to fill the need that they will have in five years time. Now, it's one example, and there's various examples around this, but what I want to highlight and I want you to take away, it's just this thought around the fact that how do we think differently about the skill we already have access to in our organization, and how do we bridge that for the future as well? I want to make a comment here, because very often when you talk about skill shortages, and it is a little bit about one of those topics that a lot of people talk about, people say, ah, you know, not my industry. You know, this, the critical shortage of skills, I know it's a problem, but it's not for me. It's not in my industry. Now, some of the latest research actually tells us that it's across all various different industries as well. And what has been starting to happen is a lot of industries have said, but hang on, let me take a step back. I'm not going to think in terms of roles any longer. I'm going to think about very specific skill sets, which means I can go and borrow and go and headhunt in other industries that I didn't do necessarily before. Think about financial services. They typically employ a lot of IT talent, but they also employ a lot of consumer type of talent. And they employ a lot of people that do very different type of work than what you would traditionally associate with the financial services industry. And that's going to start to increase a lot more where people start finding new innovative ways of new job and work design in order to be able to access the available talent pools that they have access to as well. Hey, Dieter, but before you go okay, to the next great. slide, Oh, yeah, if you don't mind, if you go back to the one side, the, the other thing I find really fascinating, I think you hit on some really amazing points is, you know, the other thing is what we're seeing is that grad and post-grad education enrollment is significantly declining. And so mm -hmm. what, what, what we're also talking about here, and you're making a really good point around an organization who's taken the initiative to build their own development curriculum to build those schools, uh, Sherry, to build those uh, skills and capabilities and certifications, because we're not, because our, our grad and post-grad educations aren't doing that on our behalf, or they're not evolving quick enough to mm -hmm. provide that supply of, of workforce, right? Which is a pretty critical issue. And then I think the, and then what's, what other, what I think the other piece of that is, as I start thinking about the, if you if you look at then that um, decrease in enrollment, 
like what is that workforce potential workforce doing are they focusing on trades are they focusing yeah. on starting their own little mini businesses on etsy and, and other things like that right so there's a lot of a uh, lot of really lost talent out there and, and i don't know if you saw this as much um, um, we're in Europe and, and, and South Africa and Africa. But, you know, one of the other things that we've seen a lot of in the U S is a lot of organizations are downgrading some of their requirements for the work. So you used mm -hmm. to need a master's and went to a bachelor's high school diploma, which in one side is great because it's increasing talent supply. The downside is you're bringing in less skilled and capability seats, less skills and capabilities. Uh, requiring the organization then to offset and spend money on all those other development pieces. So, like, right, so we're, we're seeing all of these different things being, you know, tried and attempted, but at the end of the day, we still continue to see a talent shortage. Mm. No, it's spot on, Brett. And I think it's, it's something that we definitely see all around the world in different stages, right? And in different phases, depending on what the, the unemployment and the labor market looks like. To your point, I think there's a couple of interesting things that we see in the US and Europe. The first one is this need for people to have portfolio careers, especially your younger generations, which just basically means I do more than one thing at the same time. And I can't understand why if I've got a trade, I only need to apply it in one particular place. Now, that's not gig work. That's not what I'm referring to. I'm referring here to your full time employees that also want yes. to do something else and also want to be involved in, you know, call it a side hustle, call it a pet project the case might be so we definitely I think that's a really interesting one so I'm a very firm supporter and I'll talk about skills based organizations in a moment the fact that we need to give people access to opportunities however we need to be really clear on what is really required to perform the work that we have just described because we get very lazy with regards to that right and I put down you know minimum requirement bachelor's degree I want somebody with a bachelor's degree I've already excluded 70 to 80% of the possible workforce. And the question you should ask yourself is not about whether you need a degree or not, but the question you should ask yourself is what does it really take to do the work that I've just described? Because if we start shifting in terms of thinking in that particular way, very often the talent pool starts looking very different than what the traditional parameters used to be that we used to think about. There is a downside to that, and you've mentioned that, that I believe that organizations are going to have to spend a lot more money in future in terms of capability building not just for their own people, but also for grassroots development and things like graduate programs and bringing people on board and keeping people over the longer period of time in terms of retention. And that becomes a very interesting dynamic, I think, in terms of, you know, how's that going to play out? Because I think the old saying, you know, I invest in people, especially in young talent, and then I invest in them so other people can take them. That's a narrative we need to break, but we need to put certain tangibles in place that inhibits people from, you know, wanting to shift and wanting to move on. How do you build a career in one organization, but keep it interesting and meaningful enough for people that they actually want to stay? All right, that brings us a little bit towards the point of technology, right? And I think that's the big talking point at the moment around how technology is going to change the way that we think about work. Maybe a couple of things here, and yes, generative AI is the big elephant in the room that everybody is talking about, but there's also been some other significant technological shifts that's changed the way we work today as well. And I think the first one is just, and just what I wanted to showcase with this graph is just how quickly Moby has actually changed the way that people engage and interact with each other and engage and interact with work as well. And it's been really, really significant that post the development of the World Wide Web, Moby has been the technology that's probably spread the fastest across the world in terms of adoption. And that was until generative AI really started coming into the mix and coming into the fold. And to put this into context, and most of you will probably have already seen the statistic here as well, but something like ChatGPT took them two months to achieve 100 million users. Think about some of the other big technologies that we all utilize and talk about, things like Spotify, Netflix, Airbnb. Look at the number of years that it actually took them to reach that level of adoption. Now, why is this significant? Because we need to ask the question, why is it different all of a sudden? Because artificial intelligence is not new. Now, Brett, you, may, you said in jest earlier, you know, you think about AI and you think about Terminator. Now, that's, that's, we've been talking about that for quite a period of time. So why is this new and why is this different? The very first time due to generative AI and large language models, AI is accessible to people that are not necessarily technologically oriented. 
And it means all of a sudden that people like myself and you in our personal and in our professional lives can incorporate and start augmenting what we do through the utilization of generative AI. And that has got significant promise in terms of productivity for the future. And when we think about how can I do things better through the utilization of AI in a responsible manner, but also on the other side, I'm out of things that I no longer have to do. Now, it obviously asks us this question around the fact, is AI going to take my job? I can definitely tell you that AI is going to change your job. And it's probably not going to be AI that takes it, but it's going to be somebody that knows how to utilize AI better than you that is actually going to be coming for your job as well. Now, I say that because I think I blame public media a little bit for this argument where, you know, the headlines we see is 200,000 jobs will be lost by AI in 2025, 2026, 2027, but it's not the full story. The full story is also that there will be new opportunities created, but we need to solve for that in a very different way when we start thinking about what some of these productivity gains are going to be, new ways of work design, and start thinking about augmentation pertaining to how can we utilize AI responsibly in terms of our own organizations. Really interesting studies coming out of MIT at the moment around showcasing the fact around how productivity, and we often talk about high performers, low performers, through the use of AI, that gap is actually narrowing quite a bit. Now, in the longer term, I think the high performer will still win out, but that gap is starting to narrow where the low performer through the utilization of AI is actually making some fantastic strides in terms of their own productivity and their own performance. We'll think it's going to impact and change the way that we think about talent quite significantly into the future as well. Hey, hey Dieter, real quick on that too. Yeah, oh, sorry, good. is your no, no, is, is yeah. your talking? I, I think you know because uh, I myself have been doing some research on various types of HR, or very sorry, various types of AI and how they apply to HR. But but I think what one of the things that um, I, I feel people uh, forget or potentially misled is that they think of AI as a transactional tool. It's something that you could help. Mm streamline processes or streamline transactions where in reality, I mean, it, it has such a breadth and depth of capability from, you know, examining large amounts of data and creating predictive models, you know, um, you know, if you think about from an HR perspective, you know, it's helping reduce bias and, and all of these, right, and, and creating help, uh, helping managers structure the writing better as it relates to, mm -hmm. you know, performance reviews. There's just so many applications now that, um, you know, as I kind of look at your, the, where things are being used from education services and healthcare, it's just the application is so broad. I, I think, and I look mm -hmm. at that from, a, from the peak perspective is why did it get up so quickly? is I think is as people start looking at like, oh my gosh, I can use it for all of these things. And of course there's a variety yeah. of AI out there, right? But to yeah. me, it's just such a powerful tool, but like anything else, not utilized the right way, can you know, whatever, but yeah. I won't get into all that. <laughs> Back to you. <laughs> no, but I agree with that. I think for the first time, you know, especially in the HR space, we've been talking so much, but it goes, it holds for other functions as well, right? In terms of finance, marketing, et cetera that there's certain transactional work that we want to do differently, you know, and automation is very often the answer there. But let's be honest, automation is not always the answer because automation is just I do something faster. You need to start thinking about AI as a companion to work. To your point, Brett, it's really about, you know, having access to a whole bunch of knowledge in a very different type of way. It's having access towards new ways of thinking about different elements and different things and supplementing and augmenting some of your own skill set. That's a very different component than pure automation. Automation is all about faster, better, you know, at a higher level of quality. AI is not only about that, it's also about something else there, really around the fact that how is it more insightful? How do we unlock new perspectives? And I think that's the difference, you know, in terms of not going too technical into it, but being able to say, how am I going to utilize this optimally for me? And also in my context, in my surroundings, and then within my organization. There's stuff we need to figure out, a lot of things still in terms of, you know, the EU AI Act just came out, I think, in, in towards the end of last year. Something similar in the US, a lot of conversations pertaining to privacy, the ethical side of things. Um, a lot of really interesting court cases at the moment as well. I know the New York Times has also, be, um, also sued um, OpenAI recently. The point I'm trying to make there is we have to start figuring it out, but we also have to experiment around how it is going to change and how it's going to influence you in your own personal capacity as well. 
last point I want to make here when we start talking about personal capacity is really this relationship with work and how that's starting to change. And we're already starting to see, and this is not about work-life balance only, but we're starting to see people saying, but I want something different from work. Now, sure, the pandemic raised certain questions around why we work and how do we find purpose at work, but this goes slightly deeper where people are starting to say, work forms part of my holistic life, and I want to make certain decisions which I acknowledge will have certain consequences about how I set up work in the context of my life. Now, people have been using terms like human-centric workplaces, and I'm a big supporter of that. However, on the other side, I think we've slightly misunderstood that because it doesn't mean it's only about what the employee wants. It is about creating a balance in a new type of social contract between how work gets done and what organizations are willing to offer and can offer realistically. And on the other side, what employees want from work and what they're willing to accept and what they're willing to compromise on. And through that, I think there is still the conversation around hybrid work, you know, and what hybrid work is going to look like in future. I'm excited about hybrid work less so from an employee engagement point of view, but more so from the fact that it's starting to unlock and open up new talent pools for organizations to start thinking about. I'm going to mention the hidden workforce in a moment, but what that refers to is very often people that can't work in a traditional sense. They can't work the traditional eight to five, five days a week. Hybrid work is less so about location. It's a lot more about choice, autonomy, and flexibility. And those are the three things that I firmly believe the future work contract between employers and employees are going to be based on. Open conversations about how are we going to incorporate that and what does that look like from a practical point of view. Now, whether you're a big supporter of things like the four-day work week, um, or there's various of them flying around, like there's something around a fortnight that you work and there's different all sorts of patterns. The important thing and the exciting thing is that we are starting to think beyond the traditional work construct. If you think about the eight to five, five days of work or six days of work, work week, that is something that comes out of the second industrial revolution where work was tied to a time, was tied to a place, and it was tied to everybody that had to work at the same time being in the same place together in order to get work done. Now, for a lot of jobs, that's no longer the reality. So we need to start thinking about new models and new rules of work as well. And then lastly, I just want to make the point here around the fact that we also start seeing then that this blend of a new type of workforce is going to become the norm, where people want something different and they are willing to actually take a pay cut for it because I want X time to spend on something else, or I want to pursue something different, or you know, I just have a different type of setup and that's where things like the gig market is going to explode and continue to do so going forward. However, we're also going to adapt our practices to be able to accommodate that. You know, in HR, very often we don't know how to deal with things beyond the FTE type of environment, where we then typically say, but what are these new things that we need to start thinking about? Think about well-being. If you outsource a big component of your IT organization, how invested should you be in the well-being of the people that you outsource it to? Because you're extremely dependent on them in terms of your own business continuity. And it's going to pose some really interesting questions for us just around what the future is going to hold. Before we start talking about the people practice, Chad will lead us into our next question just here in terms of how ready you believe your organization is to navigate these five trends that I've just spoken about. Thank you, Dieter. And so for our second polling question, how ready do you believe your organization is to navigate these trends? A, bring it on, we're ready. B, we are actively preparing, but there's work to do. C. We have not even thought about it yet. And we'll give you about 15 to 20 seconds here to answer this polling question. If you just select your answer and hit the submit button on your screen, your polling question will be recorded. I think everybody's ready. They're just itching to get started. <laughs> Ever the optimist, right? That's right, that's right. You know, interesting, this question, though, it's, it's um, yep. you know, a lot of it depends on the industry, the leadership, the culture. I mean, there's so many fat budgets, right? There's so many things that go into this. But I, I do find that, you know, I think just people in general and organizations, you know, have a have a innovative mindset to some extent. Like, we all want to progress as people and organization. I think it's just... You know, there's, it's how do we overcome those obstacles and challenges to do it, you know? Spot on. Yeah, and I think there's also a sense of resilience in 
um, human beings in, in themselves, right? And then within organizations, we're also starting to look at that. Well, I think you were proven right, Brett. If we look at this, we're actively preparing 62% of people, 28% saying we're not there, don't worry, there is still time. And then bring it on, we are ready uh, less than 10%, which is actually a lot more than I thought it would be. So we are heading definitely into, into the right direction. Let me share a couple of thoughts on what how people practices are then going to change as a result of these five trends that I've already mentioned. And the first one is we're going to have to start thinking differently around realigning some of our priorities. Now, this is typically in the short to medium term, but some of the things we need to start thinking about in our people strategies, spoken about this climate adaptive practices, how are we going to help ingrain this into the cultures and to the DNAs of our organizations going forward? It is becoming a lot more important, not only from a social responsibility point of view, but also from a talent attractiveness perspective and being able to access certain talent markets. We also find that employees are starting to act a lot more like activists, and that's a positive thing, but holding organizations accountable to a much higher standard than what they had in the past. And you have to start really thinking about what message are you putting out there as well. The next component here is around systemic diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And I mentioned this year because this has to become a priority for us to start thinking very differently about DEIB practices. 2022, 2023, not a great movement there in terms of DIB practices. There's a couple of things that was passed in the Supreme Court. There was also a whole bunch of, of other court cases and instances where we actually found that employees are starting to say that DIB in the way that we do it today is not working. And systemic DIB talks about the fact that how do we really get down into the systemic things that is inhibiting and keeping some people from the workforce? That has to be something on your agenda as an organization. Sometimes bias is unconscious. Go and have a look at where are you hiring from? Maybe there's certain biases that have crept in there as well. How open and approachable are you in terms of your own organization? And that has to start forming part of the talent strategies of the future. The hidden workforce I've mentioned a couple of times leading up to the conversation already. The hidden workforce refers to a part of the workforce that due to traditional barriers to work can no longer access work. Think about, for example, somebody has to be a carer for their parents. All of a sudden, they can't work an eight to five job. They need something a little bit more flexible. Think about somebody that is coming back after parental leave, for example. Unfortunately, the statistics still tell us that that actually puts people back in terms of taking parental leave. were previously incarcerated, for example. Think about people that identify as neurodivergent. There's so many workforce talent pools that we can tap into if we just start thinking a little bit broader about how flexible and open and accommodating we are as an organization. Now, this is not only the right thing to do, it's also the thing to do if you really want to be able to access the skill sets that you have, because skills are and will remain a big challenge for the future. And then the productivity paradox. Brett spoke about productivity earlier. To be very honest, since the 1980s, even though technology has improved, we actually have not become a lot more productive. We've become a lot more distracted, but not necessarily a lot more productive. Think about email. We always thought email things are going to be so quick because we can communicate all of a sudden. Now, most of you are listening to this talk. You're probably on some WhatsApp channel, on a Teams channel somewhere. Email is coming in. You can't tell me that you're more productive. You're just a lot more busy and a lot more distracted. Digital distraction is a real issue for us to sort out, not only from a well-being point of view, but our people practices need to ask the question to say the policies we are putting in place, is it really increasing productivity or are they just a nice to have? There's this whole conversation around productivity versus well-being, and I think we need to really take a stance on that in the future as well. New ways to deliver value, just two quick points here that we need to think about. Skills-based approaches we've touched on. I think it is important for you as an organization to start thinking about how am I defining the skill sets I require and how am I going to access them? Now, there is this big movement towards skills-based organizations. Two schools of thought. The one side said it's way too complicated in practice. The other side says this is the only way that we will be able to solve for the talent crisis in future. But what it basically means is we don't think about jobs any longer. We deconstruct them into what are the activities and the tasks that need to happen. Looking then at the labor market, we reconstruct those tasks and activities differently in order to open up it to more people that can actually do the skills and the activities that we require. That's also going to lead towards the fact that we need new operating models. Businesses will have to start thinking very differently about how they de deliver to a new type of consumer that we are starting to see. 
we are in the experience economy. Whether you build services or whether you build products, it doesn't matter. People expect a high level of personalization from you and they want it now, they want it immediately. Think about grocery delivery services. In the past, you used to be happy if you would get it in kind of a couple of days. Now there's a lot of companies that typically have a 10 to 15 to 20 minute type of delivery time period. And that's the type of expectation and the type of consumer that we're going to have to service in future as well. Before I get to the last one here, just a quick another question around skills. How is your organization experimenting with those? Chad, if you would lead us into the question, that would be great. Thanks, Dieter. And our third polling question of the day, how ready is your organization to experiment with skill-based approaches to work? A, we're already experimenting. B, we'll adopt this approach fully over the next three years. Or C, we are too hierarchy to move and transform. So we'll give you about 15, 20 seconds to answer this polling question. And reminder again, please select your answer and hit the submit button on your screen for the polling question to be recorded. Brett, maybe whilst this people are tricky one. have you seen some skills-based examples? Yeah, I, I think this is a tricky one. I, I think, you know, there are certain professions, like I don't know if I want an ears, nose, and throat doctor doing a heart surgery on me. You, you know what I mean? So there's like, there's, there's certain jobs, <laughs> right? That like, listen, I, I want you to be an expert. I want you to know your, but on the flip side, you know, um, if I'm an organization where I, I was actually speaking to a client yesterday, um, uh, this individual is running a, a, a customer service organization. And we were talking about scalability of the team and performance management and how how um, uh, their ability to really cross train their team, right, provided mm -hmm. so much more scale and flexibility if people are on vacation or people are out sick or, or you know, things like that. So, I mean, I, I think it definitely depends on the environment. Um, yeah. But again, I, you know, I want the right person cutting me open yeah. who needs to be cutting me open. <laughs> yeah, well, most definitely. Context matters, right? I think especially... Yeah. Um, in, in this, and I mean, interesting on the call today, you know, most people saying we are too hierarchical to move and yeah. transform. However, similar number also saying that we are already experimenting. So I definitely think that this is something interesting just to look into. And as I said, I don't think something I wouldn't advise is just go big bang with this experiment slowly and see where it works and where it doesn't work um, in your organization as well. So very, I'll very just make a quick plug and I, I didn't come up with this concept, but there's a really interesting read out there about um, hierarchy to wirearchy, right? And wirearchy mm -hmm. is the whole concept of breaking down silos and hierarchy. And to your point, we'll cover it's like really focus on building a much more skills-based culture and organization. No well, plug. I think, I think... <laughs> <laughs> no, and I think it falls into line with, um, you know, also around some of the priorities that we have for future. And the last things I want to mention just beyond you know, new ways to deliver value is, you know, how do we use our people practices to be a catalyst for good practice? And what I mean by that is how can we actually utilize how we treat our people and organizations as a force for good? And I think there's a couple of things to think about. The first one is we have to change. And remember, I say this as a fellow, very passionate HR professional, but the public relations challenge that we face and what we expect from HR teams. We have to start driving a very different narrative because the HR we want and need and should expect today is very different than the HR we had 100 years ago when it was all about welfare and hire and fire. However, that narrative still typically remains. You know, And I'll be the first to admit when I meet people and they say, Dieter, what do you do? I don't say I'm in HR because otherwise you're going to ask me to review a CV, whether you've got some opportunities available or advice on dealing with a difficult manager. We have to change that because your people function has to start playing a very, very different role in future. The second one there is around AI empowered work. And what I mean by this is we have to start participating as people practitioners in the conversation around how do we empower our workforce to utilize and adopt AI. On the one side, there's still the big fear, but on the other side, there's also just people that are not engaging with it at all. And what we've kind of done with the AI movement at the moment is we're like a dog chasing the bus. We've caught the bus and now everybody's saying, this is really nifty, but what do I now do with it? we have to start playing a role there so that AI becomes something, something that brings us together as opposed to something that brings, tears us apart in the longer term. 
very often there's a tendency to go outside immediately. Do you really know the skill sets that you have within your workforce? And my favorite anecdote here is a story of a marketing agency. They were filming on the day they were filming an advertisement uh, for television and they had a saxophone player that called in sick on the day. You know, big crisis, everybody's on site until one of the interns put up his hand and he says, you know, I play in a jazz band, I play the saxophone over the weekend. Now, I'm not trying to say you need to employ saxophone players. What I am trying to say is how well do you know the actual skill sets that you have in your organization? And how well are you growing the careers of the talent that you already have internally? It's terrible that very often we still have this practices that whatever comes from outside is more credible and better versus what we actually have in our own organizations. Um, and that's something that definitely has to change. And then lastly, just a very realistic view on work-life fit and what that's going to look like. Now, I've spoken about the fact that work-life balance is about compromise, and that's a no-go situation for a lot of people. Work-life fit is a lot more about alignment, and it's a lot more about saying, I understand, you know, maybe I don't want to be the one that works over weekends, but maybe the consequence of that is that I don't get chosen, get, um, get chosen for all the high-profile projects immediately. But it's having an open conversation about what is doable and what is not and finding that particular balance. Before I wrap for us, just on, and give back to you, Brett, I just want to ask one more question around, you know, what do we think the skill set is going to look like for the people professional of the future? And before I share our thoughts, maybe, Chad, you can lead us into the last poll. All right. We have our fourth polling question of the day. What is the most important skill for people practitioner in the future? A, problem solving, B, working data, C, business acumen, or D, driving cultures of performance? It's gonna be about 15, 20 seconds here to answer this polling question. Great, on which one's your money? Ooh, these are tough ones. I'm gonna go with driving cultures of performance. I, I personally feel there's too much gap between the employee and worker to really overall cultural performance. And I think that disconnect is one of the reasons that we find a lot of disengagement, lack of motivated employees, et cetera. There's just, there needs to be better connectivity there. That's my, that's my two cents. We'll see what the crowd says. No, I'm very curious. I mean, All right, we've got problem solving. Well, you were in second place there, right? Driving yeah. cultures of performance and then your data and business acumen. Now, what our studies have told us really is you, you need to think about the, uh, the professional of the future in terms of a couple of things. And we call it skill set, mindset, heart set, and tool set, supported by a very strong professional identity. And just to briefly share what these imply and what they refer to, on the skill set side, we talk about T-shaped professionals, which means there's five core skills everybody needs. Business acumen, being able to work with data and tell stories, data literacy, digital agility, how do I leverage and work through technology, cultures of well-being, cultures of performance, execution excellence, how do I show up? So almost the interpersonal skill sets around how I influence, how I network, how I build relationships. That has to be supported by your specialist competencies, depending on the context or the role that you're in. And then leadership competencies, if you do lead people or lead teams within the organization. Next one, then from a tool set point of view, we need to acknowledge that people need to be able to work in the digital world. They need to be able to work in the physical world, but also learn how to work asynchronously going forward. And that's going to become important when people start expanding and we have this multiple blend of workforce coming from different parts of the world. And it's quite a skill set to learn from how do I communicate and still be productive and effective in that type of setting. On the mindset side, we need curious people, people that are curious about what's happening in the world and curious about what that means for them. People that are able to deal with the complexity of what the future of work is going to offer, analytical in their thinking. And yes, as you've already mentioned on the previous slide, problem solving. We need people that think innovatively about how do we solve problems with the resources we have in new and innovative ways. On the hard set side, and I know this is not a real word, but what it refers to is how how do we create people that have the courage to do what is required? The self-belief and the confidence and the empathy, the openness to experiment and really that resilience that we spoke about earlier. Because yes, there will be stumbling blocks towards the future, but it is a good news story if people are willing to engage with that going forward. And all of this can only happen if we're very clear about our professional identity. 
what we stand for, who we are, the values that drive us, and really the purpose that motivates us. And purpose is not necessarily about a higher cause. It's about understanding how I contribute and how I actually fit in to the broader organization through the work that I also do on my side. So just to summarize and Brett, and I'm gonna hand back to you. I spoke a little bit about the big mega trends. So some of the key things that we are seeing that will change in the world of work. AI, we spoke about the labor market changes. We spoke about advances in technology, the global economic power shifts that we're seeing, and then a change in the relationship that people have with work. I also highlighted some new things in terms of how that's going to influence HR and people functions going forward, some new priorities for us on the horizon, new ways to think about delivering value, and then also the question around how do we become that catalyst for good practice. And then lastly spoke about, but what does this actually mean for the people professional or the professional of the future around the skill set, mindset, tool set, and heart set that they require? And then central to that, the identity of who you are as a professional person as well. And on that note, Brett, I'm going to hand back to you just for a, a couple of reflections. Oh, Brett, I think you're on mute. It's that moving lip thing that no one hears and coming out. <laughs> I was just saying, dear, I think you did a great job. Uh, it's as I reflect back on a lot of the well conversations I have every day. I mean, there's so much relevance in terms of this material. Um, you know, as as you know, the issues and and frustrations that our clients are are facing. And I just say our clients. I would say probably all organizations around the world. So I don't really have anything to add. I think you covered it all. I I um you know, I actually actually one thing that you did say mentioned towards the end is I do think that you you are spot on uh, regarding hidden talents within our own organizations. And I do think, you know, whether it's being able to capture skills, capture certifications, capture learning, um, I, as you start unpacking your organization, I often find that there's a lot of hidden gems that you're like, why haven't I been using this person to do X, Y, or Z, you know, for five so years, you know, um, and that's really the difference in, in looking at your talent differently as, um, you know, re really a, a broader set of assets. Um, than just uh, than just people. So um, we have one more polling question. So I'm going to jump to that. Um, and I just want to preface. Oh, I had one in here. I guess it, it's gone now. Did, did we take that out, Chad? Or is it? No? Yeah, it's Anyways. been available so for we'll... the. I okay. was going to say it. it's right, been we'll... available for the presentations. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I got you. Okay. All right. So there were a couple questions um, that I wanted to address really quickly. And I'm happy to, and I'm sure Dieter is as well, to follow up offline. Cheryl um, Horbin, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, basically, as I understand, there are currently four generations in the workplace. Where do you see this going? And what are the impacts of the trends you're presenting uh, on in the current and potential future mix of the generations in the workforce? I can give my perspective. Dieter, do you want to mm -hmm. comment on that? Uh, yeah, maybe a, sh a short comment from my side, um, Brett, Cheryl, definitely there's, you know, definitely around what people want from work and their relationship with work and how they think work needs to take place. We find, you know, some people say that's as a result of generations. Other people say it's as a result of what you're exposed to in a certain time or period within your life. The point that this makes is we got in conflict, I think, especially between leaders and managers and the workforce that they tend to manage. And we're going to have to find different ways of thinking about what the workforce actually wants around things like employee value propositions, et cetera. So I think it is real. I wouldn't say it's only about generations. I think there's other parts that also play into that as well. But that relationship with work thing is a key thing that's going to play into this trend. I, I agree with that. And, and um, Cheryl, one is, is, is your, as you said that, message in i was like so we now even have a new generation called generation alpha right and it's like every 10 or so years a new generation or is is going to be popping up and you know it, it's it's this is i think is not just generational but i think this is a a big area um as Dieter talked about employer value proposition and and starting to think differently around the employee experience um the culture all of these things um are really, really critical um, as we think about the overall generation. I mean, what my, what my kids look at 
what my grandkids look at. Just I had a grandchild yesterday. Uh, what he's going to look at, right, is very different than the things that we did as it relates to, you know, where you work and how you work and who you work with and all of these other things. Um, but I but I would say in general, I think most of the areas that Deidre, you covered, I mean, you're right. They're not they're not generational. I mean, it's, uh, you know, everyone or you know, a lot of these different workers are out there looking for new ways to work, new ways to do things, wanting to work longer, uh, wanting to work different. Um, so it's a, it's a interesting question. I'm happy to dive into that more. And then Donna asked a question. Um, oh, we're right on time. But our company does not approve a remote work. Do you feel this is what the job force expects now? Um, and I think, again, that does come back to how you're used to working. And, and I think it also looks, I think every industry is a bit different. I mean, it's, if you're a construction company, it's hard to have some of those people work remote, right? Cause they're required to be on site. Um, so it also looks at the roles uh, are also going to be really critical in that. So, but we could definitely unpack that offline. I'll send you an email, Don. And if you want to chat, we can chat more, but I think that's it. Chad, do you want to wrap us up? Yeah, thank you, Brett and Dieter, for a great presentation today. Um, if we didn't have time to answer your questions, we'll do our best to follow up with you after the webcast. As a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in the slide deck and handouts window. If you participated as an individual and met all certification requirements, your certification is available for download now in the CPE progress window. I'll keep the webcast open, console open for a few minutes to give you time to download your CPE certificate. And a copy of your CPE certificate will be emailed within three weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now. Here's a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete this as your feedback is very important to us. And thank you again for joining us today and hope you join us again next time. Thanks, Chad. Well, great job, Dieter. Thanks for your time. Thanks so much, Pete. Thanks, Chad. Lovely to be with you. Yep. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.